Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Jordan Has No Life, which is at least a top 50% systems design channel on YouTube. Today you'll be witnessing me performing an SDUI, aka Systems Design Under the Influence, as I just get back from my company happy hour. I was supposed to record this thing last night, and in fact I did do so. However, of course, when I actually checked the footage, my microphone was not turned on, and I immediately raged and threw a tantrum. So let's go ahead and talk about Spark one more time before I go insane. Have a good one, and I will see you in the iPad. All right, so as it turns out, today we're talking about Apache Spark. This is a tool that a lot of engineers use, but in my experience is probably one that a lot of engineers don't understand why it is that they're using. So let's get started by talking about that. Why would we use Spark? Well, in order to understand that, we must first understand why MapReduce sucks. Probably even harder than my ex-girlfriend. So let's get started there. MapReduce has three main issues with it, so let's touch upon all three. The first being that, as I mentioned in a couple of videos ago, in MapReduce, if we want to express more complex functionality, we'll use chain jobs. Now, chain jobs don't know about one another. Effectively, you're just saying, do job number one, then do job number two, then do job number three. And what that means is that we have lots of waiting. So for example, let's imagine we finish this part of our MapReduce job one, but then this part is lo lollygagging over here. We can't get started on this part of MapReduce job number two until this guy is done. And so this guy is just idly waiting, right? It doesn't really do anything, and as a result, we're just wasting our own time. A second thing is that each job requires a mapper and reducer. And frankly, after mapping one time, a lot of the time, we don't really need another mapper, especially because keep in mind that mappers actually perform sorting functionality. And doing a bunch of unnecessary sorting is n log n complexity, which is super costly when it's on a big data set, such as the ones we're using in batch processing. Now, number three is that we have tons of disk usage. So the issue with having tons of disk usage is that obviously it's expensive, but MapReduce in particular uses lots of disk because jobs materialize intermediate state. So keep in mind that every MapReduce job goes from disk to disk, and when we're chaining them, we only care about the first and the last outcome. We don't care about this middle guy right here. And so wouldn't it be great if we just didn't ever write that to our hard drive because that wastes a ton of time. So these are three main reasons why MapReduce sucks. And as a result of that, Spark tries to improve upon all three of these things. So how does it do it? Let's take a look at the architecture of a typical Spark job. So what Spark will actually do, and imagine we've got three nodes in our Hadoop cluster here performing a batch computation, is it will only write things to disk on input and on output, as you can see, which is super great. But in addition to that, as opposed to using mappers and reducers, every single function that we want to perform on our data is expressed as an operator. And operators can basically have arbitrary code. Unlike mappers and reducers, where there's typically some mapping phase, a sorting phase, a shuffle, and then a reduction, operators can basically do anything. So you'll see an example of an operator right here that could be something like a mapping where you're taking certain data and then putting it into the next phase. And then here's one where we're actually doing some shuffling, where we're repartitioning our data. And then here's another example of a map or something like that. It could be a reduce as well, who knows. So what also makes Spark special is this guy right here in between, which is where we actually hold our data. And this is known as an RDD, or a resilient distributed data set. I believe that's what it stands for. Don't quote me on that. I'm drunk. But assuming that that's what RDD does stand for, which I'm pretty sure it is, the important thing about RDDs are they are in memory. And as a result of being in memory, it means that we can avoid writing our intermediate state to disk, and by doing so, we speed up our performance significantly. In addition, of course, since Spark is aware of the entire object computation graph for a query, it can actually just go ahead and get started with computations as soon as all of the data is available from the previous step. So that's very important to know. So Spark can speed things up a lot. However, you should now be thinking to yourself, shoot, if Spark is doing everything in its intermediate states in memory, what happens if we fail in the middle of the way of our Spark job? That is going to be where we spend the remainder of this video. So Spark basically looks at a potential query plan, right? And a query plan is gonna look similar to this last slide over here, where it basically draws out all the dependencies of all the stages of that Spark job. 
and it's going to define every single operator as two types of things, basically a narrow dependency or a wide dependency. So what is a narrow dependency? A narrow dependency is basically when you know all computation stays on one node between two steps of the Spark job. So what would be an example of that? Let's say we've got a bunch of messages here with the following keys and then we've got some messages corresponding to them and we basically say for every single message get the number of characters in that message. Hence why we have three and four and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's gonna be a narrow dependency because we don't have to do any shuffling of data to move on to the next step. We're literally just counting the number of characters and that entire step is local to the node where the data lives. So what actually happens in a narrow dependency type of situation where we have a fault of our hardware? Let's say that this guy right here, A3 and B4 goes down. So keep in mind that again, we don't have access to this anymore because this was in memory, but we do probably have access to some sort of replica of it. So we still have the original data that came from disk. So what we'll typically end up doing here is because this is a narrow dependency, we know that all of the computation for these steps can be reperformed on any given machine. And so what we'll typically do to make that as fast as possible is we'll actually parallelize it. So typically we would move one piece of data over to the other nodes in our cluster and basically split that up accordingly. And then we could parallelize the computation of that uh, narrow dependency such that we basically just go ahead and split it up amongst the remaining nodes in the cluster. And as you can see, now what we've done is basically just remake up all of that compute. And that's great. We can rerun everything. It'll be relatively fast because if one node fails, we can split up that work amongst a bunch of other nodes and we're good to go. However, things aren't always this simple. Sometimes what we have are wide dependencies. So this is a little bit more challenging to explain, but the example of our wide dependency in this case is going to be this guy here. The reason it's a wide dependency is because unlike narrow dependencies, where all of the data from one step to another is contained locally on one node, in a wide dependency, we actually have to rely on data from other nodes in order to get our computation done for the next step. So let's say, for example, that A3, A6 went down right here, right? This is going to be node number one. Let's say in T equals three, this guy goes down. So the issue right now is that we need to be able to recompute this state right here. But we can't also recompute this whole state without also having access to this state and this state and this state. Now keep in mind, this guy is down, this entire node. <clears throat> and more importantly, another issue right now is that this guy is no longer in memory because we moved on to the next step over here at t equals three, and now we no longer have access to our previous state. So what does Spark do to actually deal with wide dependencies and basically the issue of them being hard to recover from? Well, it'll say, okay, at t3, we just got past a wide dependency. So right now, what we're gonna do is write to disk. So basically whenever Spark sees a wide dependency and whenever we finish dealing with that wide dependency, we write our data to disk. The reason for that being that it's very hard to recover from these. So in the event that say A equals nine goes down, what we can actually do is we recover our state from disk. And I'm now realizing that that might be hard to see, so I'll write it again down here. We recover from disk. And then what you'll notice is from t equals three to t equals four, we only have narrow dependencies. Narrow, narrow, narrow. And then we would resolve this problem in the same way that we would with a typical narrow dependency where I would take a three over here, I would take a six over here, and then we would go ahead and parallelize that computation as expected with a narrow dependency. And so the general solution or the general point I'm trying to make here is four wide dependencies will occasionally have to checkpoint to disk. And that is a little bit more expensive, but it allows us to be fully fault tolerant, which is great. So what is the conclusion in terms of using Spark? What do I really want you to take away from this video? Well, for number one, it's certainly much faster than MapReduce, right? Because A, nodes will do computations as soon as the data is available. Number two is that all of the immediate state 
that uh, you know we don't really need to be writing to disk is generally kept in memory. Of course, the exception to this is right after we finish a wide dependency, in which case we temporarily materialize things to disk so that we can make sure that we're fault tolerant. And number three, and also very important, is that we don't have to sort our data at every single step. If we have huge data sets, this is extremely time consuming. At the same time, Spark does use more memory than MapReduce. Whereas MapReduce can basically keep things on disk and due to sorting, make sure that the memory footprint is relatively low, Spark is keeping all of our computation state in an RDD. And as a result of that, technically our compute cluster may be using more memory during a Spark job than it would during a MapReduce job. And technically what that means is that if we have certain other things that we wanna be doing with our cluster, there might be less memory available. Nonetheless, there's a reason that you see everyone using Spark, and that is because this speed benefit is extremely, extremely noticeable, and as a result, Spark is a great technology. Anyways, guys, I hope you have a great rest of the weekend. I am going to enjoy this drunkness right now, and so I will see you in the next one.